interested in boats of any description, but my husband Ian and I are now very much involved uh, in electric boating. We're both committee members of the Electric Boat Association, and that's its Grebe symbol on the screen now. Uh, Ian also designs and builds electric propulsion systems for boats, and he'll give you more details of some of these in the second half of our talk. So first, a little bit of history. Uh, <coughs> electric boats in England go back to the 19th century, when boating for pleasure became increasingly popular. Steamboats came first, but it was in the 1880s that electric motors were linked with accumulators, uh, which were lead-acid batteries built into glass jars uh, to power electric launches. They were much quieter than the steamboats and had the ad great advantage for Victorian ladies that their elegant dresses and big hats didn't get covered in coal smuts. Most of the electric boats on the inland waterways then were around 15 to 45 feet in length, and traditional canoes like this one were a very popular hull shape. This is Simba, built in 1908 and still in use under electric power today on the Thames. Rather grander, although not in name, was 52-foot cabin launch Humble, built of mahogany on oak, and commissioned by the Prince of Wales for a European tour in the early 1900s. If you didn't own a boat, you could hire one. In 1889, Moritz Imish, one of the early pioneers of electric boating, set up a fleet of electric launches for hire on the Thames. They operated in conjunction with a chain of <coughs> charging stations from Richmond to Reading, which used steam or gas engines along with dynamos to charge the boat's batteries. An Imish also ran passenger boats, one of which was Lady Lena, built in 1890 and licensed to operate a river service around Maidenhead. In 1919, Lady Lena was bought by the Bedford <coughs> Steamboat Company and ran a regular service on the River Great Ouse, which cost one shilling, or five pence in today's money, for a one-hour trip. And Lady Lena is still running. You might have seen the leaflets out there. It's the world's oldest working electric boat, and Ian will tell you more about it uh, and about the new electric propulsion <coughs> system he installed in it. In France, Gustave Trouvé took out his first patent for a dry cell battery in 1865. He designed an electric launch for the River Seine, and he went on to develop what he described as a rudder containing the propeller and its motor, the whole of which is removable and easily lifted off the stern of the boat. So in other words, the very first electric outboard motor. The world's first regular passenger service using electric boats began in Norway in 1894. And soon, 1,600 passengers were commuting across Bergen Harbor on eight electric ferries, which did 40 sea miles a day. Each boat was eight meters long by two meters wide and could carry 18 passengers, including crew. The boats had a propeller at each end, mounted on a common shaft coupled directly to a three horsepower electric motor. The Hagen batteries under the seats had a capacity of 20 kilowatt hours and the boats could, carry a 10 could travel at 10 kilometers an hour and they were recharged overnight by a 30 horsepower dynamo and could also have a four minute topping up charge between trips. Now the development of petrol engines at the turn of the 20th century and the effects of the First World War led to the decline of electric propulsion as well as steam in Europe. A few boat yards in England kept electric canoes and launches for hire but by the mid-1930s, even these had disappeared, and there was virtually no interest in electric boats in the UK until about 1975. 
and that was when electric outboards developed in America as trolling motors for fishermen on the lakes began to be imported, and when two enthusiasts, Rear Admiral Percy Jick and Lord St. Davids, did some serious electric boating. Percy Jick, supported by the Midland Electricity Board, took an electric Trent Craft cruiser called Electra of Emsworth, 600 miles up the Thames and along the canals, and Lord St. David's moored Silver Sail, a small narrow boat powered by two prototype Lynch outboard motors at the bottom of his garden on the Regent's Canal, and between 1981 and 1991, cruised over 4,000 miles on the inland waterways. And the two of them also founded the Electric Boat Association in 1982, the first of its kind in the world, to promote the use of electric boats and the industry associated with them. In the 1980s, Rupert Latham began building the frolic range of fiberglass launches, ranging from 18 to 32 feet in length. The frolics are easy to operate, with not too much maintenance involved, and they help to make electric launches popular. They're still being made today, and they can often be found as hire boats at riverside hotels. This one operates a water taxi service from a holiday caravan park to the centre of Stratford-on-Avon. Now, along with developments in battery power, small solar panels became practical. Alan Freeman, uh, not to be confused with the disc jockey of the same name, uh, designed the first solar-powered boat, an eight-foot catamaran built a marine ply with a DC motor powered directly by the sun. This is the original version with one solar panel, but he went on to improve performance with two panels mounted on tripods, and on the 10th of May, 1978, Solarcraft One made a trip of 4.1 miles in two hours along the canal at Rugby. 19 years later, in 1997, our president of the Electric Boat Association, Malcolm Moss, set the record for the first crossing of the English Channel by solar power in this, his launch, Kalinda, a 20-foot catamaran with a canopy consisting of 20 solar panels. Then, after only 10 years, in 2007, Sun 21, a 14-metre-long catamaran built by MW Line in Switzerland, made the first solar crossing of the Atlantic. The hulls were linked by a large deck covered in solar panels, which powered the two 8-kilowatt motors, one in each hull, via a high-efficiency electronic controller. During the day, the panels charged two battery packs for continuous cruising overnight. Sun 21 was the test bed for a much larger boat, which last month sailed into the record books after traveling right round the world using only the power of the sun. Planet Solar set off from Monaco in September 2010 and arrived back on the 5th of May this year after a 585-day voyage visiting 28 countries en route. It's the largest solar boat ever built, 35 meters long, with 537 square meters of solar panels. Maximum en engine power is 120 kilowatts, with 20 kilowatts used for normal cruising. Now, Sun 21 and Planet Solar were designed to demonstrate a much wider use for electric boats. Uh, because up to now I've mainly talked about leisure boating, and of course it would be good if there were only electric boats on lakes and inland waterways, which can often be used as a source of drinking water. Electric boats don't pollute the water and they don't disturb the wildlife, or people on the bank with noisy petrol or diesel engines. A number of water authorities offer a reduction in license fees for electric boats, 
and the, the Electric Boat Association is encouraging them to install charging points at regular intervals. Some lakes in Europe and the USA already ban petrol and diesel boats completely. Electric ferries, too, are becoming increasingly popular. Sadly, the ones in Bergen Harbour now run on diesel, but there are a number operating on waterways in Europe. This is the new solar electric ferry in the port of Marseille. It can carry 40 passengers, makes a crossing at seven knots every three minutes. And like the Bergen ferries, it's double-ended with two 12-kilowatt pod <coughs> motors at the bow and the stern, which can pivot 180 degrees. The ferries built by the Australian company Solar Sailor been carrying passengers in Sydney Harbour since the 2000 Olympics. The 100-seat passenger boats use rigid photovoltaic sails, and these can be tilted towards the sun to supply their electric motors. Electric power can also be used for transporting heavy loads. A 20-metre long barge is now operating uh, with zero emission freight transport in Amsterdam. It can carry 56 tons, so replacing five or six standard lorries in the narrow streets of the city centre. And it travels silently along the canals at seven kilometres an hour, stopping to offload goods with its electric hydraulic crane. And when it's away from the city centre, its batteries can be charged by mains power or, if necessary, two diesel generators. And how about this for a clean cleaning boat? Uh, it's the Solar Sea Cleaner, designed to collect floating waste in harbors and bathing areas using a basket between its two hulls. Its solar panels provide 600 watts to power its two electric motors. And the boat was built by Swiss company Grove Boats, which takes its name from the fuel cell pioneer Sir William Grove. The Mansoura Trophy was established in 2007 to encourage new developments in hybrid electric boats, and the runner-up in the 2009 competition was the Ross Barlow. The awards are sponsored by Bosch Engineering now, and they're organized by the Royal Thames Yacht Club and the Green Blue, which is a joint environmental initiative by the Royal Yachting Association and the British Marine Federation. Even large cruise ships, including the Queen Mary II, are now diesel electric, and one of the cruise lines was very pleased to promote its green credentials recently by advertising the fact that when docked in Vancouver, it could run all its onboard services on hydroelectric power by plugging into the city grid. So from modest beginnings, electric boats can now be found all over Europe and North America, carrying holidaymakers in Dubai and on the Indian lakes, taking trips on the Gambia River and through a nature reserve in Thailand, you can see diesel electric fishing boats in Japan, a solar powered water taxi in Chile, and electric dragon boats at the Summer Palace in Beijing. And this coming weekend, the Electric Boat Association will be celebrating its 30th anniversary with around 20 electric boats at Abingdon on the Thames. So I'll now hand over to Ian to give you more details about some of the electric boats he's designed and built. Good morning. I'm Ian Rutter. I wear two hats. Uh, I'm vice chairman of the Electric Boat Association and the designer and builder of electric boats for the Thames Electric Launch Company. I've been doing this for 20 years and have been involved with about 150 electric boats, building over 50 new uh, complete installations of my own design. Lady Lena, built in 1890, this is the world's oldest working electric boat, running commercially on the Kennet Navan Canal at Bath. Fitted with a 4.5 kilowatt, 48 volt CEPEX motor in 2004. Unfortunately, this technology is already obsolete after just eight years because of the pace of change of, of modern technology. 
This is the original 1920 series motor, two and a half horsepower or 1.8 kilowatt, fitted into Beezy. A famous canoe, originally owned by the actress Beatrice Lilly, is about 60% efficient at best. I've just fitted a new three and a half kilowatt AC motor running about 80% efficient and half the size and weight, and I'll tell you more about this later. This is a local boat fitted with our hybrid system. The owner, Paul Baumer, who got his electrical engineering degree here at Birmingham University, has calculated that running the diesel engine and charging the batteries for a day uses a negligible amount of extra fuel. He couldn't measure it to charge up the batteries. This enables him to run a full electric for a full day when, while making professional videos of the waterways. The result is a video with the wind in the reeds and the world and the bird life on the soundtrack, not the thump of the diesel. Some waterways are a source of potable water and will now only allow electric boats because of pollution fears. The River Stour Trust is only allowed to operate electric trip boats through Constable Country. And the wildlife reserve at Wickham Fen converted their old reed lighter to electric drive using it both as a work boat and a trip boat for observing the wildlife. In the winter, the banks are so muddy they can't take vehicles there, so they use this boat instead so they don't do any damage. Speed is controlled by a simple two-speed switch, altering the field coils in the motor. Crude, but effective. Uh, this is the only electric boat I've had to modify to make it go slower so they can see the wildlife when it's going by. Motors. All the old series and CEPEX motors, and even some newer motors like the Pancake Lynch motor fitted to the Ross Barlow contained brushes. This is a major problem in electric boats. The brushes are prone to damp conditions and stick in the brush holder, thus overheating causing damage to the commutator and eventually breaking up. Repairing the damage shown like this is very expensive. Controllers for these old motors are getting difficult to source, but they are rapidly becoming obsolete. When something jams the prop and stops the motor rotating, the controller runs up to the maximum set current, which is fine under normal operating conditions, but with a motor stopped, because it causes burning of the brushes and commutator, which rapidly fails, and you get this, the brushes just fall apart. Modern AC or brushless DC motors incorporate a shaft encoder. This reports back to the controller what the motor is actually doing. If it stops when it shouldn't, the maximum amps will only circulate within the motor coils before the controller shuts down with no damage. Also, the RPM can be set to exact requirements to get maximum efficiency from the boat. All the parameters are set in the controller using software, with many extra benefits of parameters being incorporated for specific installations. And the rapid improvement in the power of the FETs make the controllers ever more powerful and efficient. Lady Charlotte here, this is a 43-foot boat I fitted with a 10 kilowatt AC drive. Under test, we needed one and a half kilowatts for the legal river speed of five miles an hour. It's, uh, not very fast, eight kilometers an hour. And the maximum speed we got was 8.1 miles an hour, and we needed 10 kilowatts for that. At this speed, we were threatened with being reported for speeding by the occupants of a racing skiff who couldn't get past us at Henley. Uh, so far, I've managed to keep all my systems to a maximum of 48 volts, and I do this to keep me within the easier regulations for under 50 volts. And the maximum practical power at this voltage is about 12 kilowatts, which is more than adequate for the inland, UK inland waterways. Now back to Beezy. The owner left his boat switched on over winter, thus ruining the battery pack. Uh, this cost him £2,000 for new batteries. Unfortunately, a friend of his borrowed the boat and did the same thing the following year. So I've just replaced the 1920 motor you saw earlier with a new 3.5 kilowatt AC drive system and improved the efficiency by about 34%. And the flexibility to incorporate tailored software is a great step forward. So I've added an automatic off parameter after 60 minutes if a throttle command is not sensed. The system shuts down and this should preserve the batteries, I hope. Lead-acid batteries are not suitable as a buffer between a power source and a motor drive. 
They must be charged correctly and kept fully charged. The charging must follow the three stages of bulk, absorption, and equalize at the correct voltages and currents. If just used as a buffer, they will often be trickle or opportunity charged and spend their life always part charged. This will shorten the life quite dramatically from about 10 years to as little as two years at best. Uh, lithium batteries are happy, of course, to be left part charged, but have other problems of management and huge cost. I always now fit gel batteries. As under charge, they do not give off fumes and need no water. I have found very few owners who remember to fill up wet batteries. They just, just leave them and rot. Also, traction gel can be left for a year without charge, but wet traction has a, quite a poor self-discharge profile. This is a major problem with owners who lay their boats up over winter. Uh, gel batteries can be fitted in the cabin with only emergency passive ventilation emer permitted under the boat safety scheme, or mounted on their side under the floorboards as shown here. And Stradag. This boat held the world speed record for electric boats of 51 miles an hour in 1989. It went into a museum and then was refitted with new Cedric Lynch's motors, as in the Ross Barlow. And we ran 68 miles an hour in 2005. This is us doing it. We thought we'd achieved a new world record. However, the UIM rules had changed and our recharging after the outward run was no longer allowed. Unfortunately, nobody had told us. We discharged the lead-acid batteries at near 1,000 amps in under a minute uh, and recharged within the 20 minutes allowed at the turnaround. The batteries were orbital sealed starter motor batteries chosen for their high cranking amps ability. Not the best way to treat batteries for a long service life, but seven years later I still have some and have recently tested their capacity, which is nearly 100%. Juliana canoe. A canoe is probably the most efficient hull shape to push through the water. One kilowatt gives five miles an hour, and 4.8 kilowatts gives over eight miles an hour. Compare this for the more usual shaped boats. This is the measured power requirements for driving three different types of boat. For narrow boats, the power requirements can be split into two distinct sections, drive motor and domestic loads. The modern narrowboat has a huge domestic load for all the services required from electronic devices to lighting and washing machines. This can be as high as three or four kilowatts. To provide this load, either the main diesel engine or a separate diesel generator is often run at the over future, but I hope he can. <laughs> Eddy current our boat. Solar panels. Everybody likes the idea of solar panels but unfortunately they don't produce much electricity per square meter. On our boat here, I have designed the roof to take solar panels and fit, can fit about a kilowatt's worth. This will cost me 4,000 pounds, and on a sunny day extend our cruising range by about an hour. The battery pack of eight by 180 amper hour six volt gel batteries will give me a full day's cruising, which I can then recharge overnight as normal. If the batteries are completely flat, the cost of the recharge is an eye-watering amount, about £1.50. So how can I justify £4,000 worth of solar panels? It doesn't work. Back. To extend the range, I could add another battery pack. However, this would weigh a quarter of a ton. So to keep the weight down while, while towing, I fitted a quiet generator, diesel generator in the stern. This gives us infinite range, but I'd love to change this for a fuel cell. This is an example of a small trailable electric boat which can easily be slipped into a waterway from any modest slipway. Cheap, easily towed by an any family car, plenty of room for a family, and an ideal way to start out exploring the waterways. It would be delightful if a small fuel cell could be used instead of batteries, thus making the boat even lighter. Batteries are too expensive and too, have too short a life compared with a motor drive, which seldom wears out. They're also very prone to neglect, either through stupidity or just ignorance. We must build electric drive systems which can be operated by totally non-technical owners who just want to enjoy the waterways. I believe the future lies with fuel cells and supercapacitors. 
these would respond quickly to a peak power load while giving the fuel cell time to ramp up to the demand. They can be recharged almost an infinite number of times without deterioration. Unfortunately, they're still at an early stage of development and so they're <coughs> too expensive but do hold great potential. Another important thing is to use industry standard components when designing electric pul propulsion systems for marine use. This gives boatyards a chance to maintain the boats by calling in those engineers who are familiar with forklift trucks or other materials handling vehicles. Creating a custom electronic controller and operating system can leave a very expensive problem if the builder has gone out of business or if no one understands how it works. Boatyards are not electronically minded at all. I have had to re-engineer several boats where this has happened. The customer wasn't pleased to receive a bill for several thousands of pounds. Infrastructure on the waterways is vital to promote electric boats. There have been initiatives in the past which have failed. A practical initiative is to help to install charging points where people actually want to moor up overnight. Uh, what about waterway pubs? Be a good start. And perhaps a, a deal where you get a half a price of a pint for every kilowatt hour you buy. You know? My customer with this boat said that when he first went out, he had a grin from ear to ear. He then said that grin is still there a year later. Uh, I'll leave you with a lock full of electric boats, greening the waterways. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The back, the last boat I showed you, that one, that one, yeah. uh, has a Minn Kota trolling motor on it. So you're talking a maximum cruising around about four or five hundred watts at the most at the speed it would do. Uh, because it's light and simple, 600 watts is all the motor will give. So you wouldn't need more than that. So it would never. But all day long, you'd probably be doing three or four hundred watts. Yes, it is. Yes. <coughs> Problem with Minn Kotas is their trolling motors. They all push a boat at the same speed. No matter which one you buy, you can buy a little one or a big one. You go at the same speed. People don't realise that, and you only buy a bigger one to push a heavier boat. <laughs> the prop goes around at the same speed with the same pitch, <laughs> so you can't go faster. And w being trolling motors, if you run them near the flat-out speed uh, with a click-click switch version, you burn the switch out and with the electronic version, which is much more efficient because it's not got resistors heating up the, the water, it's got a proper controller in it, uh, you do have a more efficient way of doing it, but even the controllers die if you run them flat out all the time, we find. They're not designed for it, they're, they're trolling motors for fishermen. It's really a really fishing motor. Yeah. It just wants to hang, but uh, it's not right. yeah. Yeah. And they are silent. There are now more efficient and much higher powered outboard motors made by Torquedo with lithium batteries all built in. Uh, very efficient, uh, very powerful, somewhat noisy and extremely expensive. But they're running at 48 volts, are they? They vary. They, some do, yes. Yes. Thank you. Would you like to make a comment? I'll ask you to make a comment about the solar panel. Yes. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I agree with you that uh, you know, getting electric motors working Square meter is a challenge. Um, it can be you can be achieved if you use this kind of solar cells are used in space with very high efficiency and very high cost. But I think the, uh, the biggest barrier really is the cost, isn't it? You mentioned four thousand pounds per kilowatt. That sounds very high to me. Now the prices have come down considerably over the past year, two years. Um, this is this is caused chaos for the government. 
responded very slowly to what's been happening in the industry, the changes, what we've heard on the news with the change in the feed-in tariff. Um, however, the good news is that PV now is much more affordable. So the question is, um, how much power do you need and what sort of cost would be acceptable? You say the cost of the solar panels have come down. Yes, they have. But the ones that have come down are the big 30 mil glass panels. Now, on boats, you don't have flat surfaces. You have, if you look at those, all those boats have roundy tops. And on this boat here, you can see that panel has been incorporated into the hatch top, which is what you would do on a boat. I would do that. I, the semi-flexible panel would fit the profile of the roof and not make the boat look ugly. Unfortunately, that type of solar panel has not come down in price because they're not mass produced for putting on roofs. So what sort of price would be acceptable? I don't know. I think if it's below a thousand, I would start thinking yes. For a kilowatt. For a kilowatt. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I agree with you. In, 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 in the marine world, the price just, just doubles. Yeah. Part of the problem is that uh, they tend to be seen as a niche third volume market. Yes. Yes. There are some people who launch their boats in the spring and keep them on a mooring where they have no mains electricity, in which case uh, charging up during the week from solar panels is vital because otherwise they wouldn't then be able to use their boats the weekend. So there, cost is not such a, a significant it's. factor. But to us, where we bring the boat back home and plug in from the mains, and as Ian said, it costs about one pound fifty for to to fill up the batteries. Then <laughs> the cost of solar panels it doesn't really come into it. So it's it's it's, it's low, low cost, flexible, and light. Yes. That's what we want. Yeah, I'll yes. take that as a challenge. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you find a lot of takers in the Electric Boat Association. Any, any other comments? All right. So we're spot on time.